Okay, diving all my ducks in a row in. Excellent. Questions 24 to 32. Yes, I know. Why is it number six? Shouldn't it be homework number five? Uh, yes, originally the last assignment that you had was actually split up into two assignments, one that went with the lab in class. So when I combined them together into one assignment, uh, I forgot to renumber the rest of the assignments on the pages. So whatever you title it, I don't care um, because I'm gonna be looking at the numbers that you did. So 24 to 32 is the part that I look to see that you did. What you call it on top, I'm not looking at that because you could just say that it's the next assignment and not actually do the assignment. And then I really wouldn't be doing my job as a teacher. Even though for some of you, when I get your emails, I click them on and then I immediately scroll down to the bottom and click thank you before I even look at anything because you're, you have given me three years of honesty. Why would I look at it unless you ask me a question? So, um, so please don't be offended if you accidentally turn in the wrong assignment, get credit for it, and then we're like, wait a minute here. He's not even, he doesn't even care about my stuff. Yeah, I do. It's just that your honesty, I don't, um, I, I'm not going to waste the time. So we could talk in Zoom. That's the time for us to waste time. Inertia depends on mass. Rotational inertia depends on mass and also distribution of mass. So in other words, if you want to move an object, we care about how large this mass is. But if you want to spin an object, now you apply a force at an angle, we would call that a torque. And so it's going to cause it to go in a circle. If it's going to go in a circle, it really depends on where you distribute the mass on that will decide how, uh, uh, how quickly it, it angularly accelerates. A good example of this is when you guys are out there doing your slack lining, right? When you string a, a, um, a rock climbing rope between two trees, but you don't pull it super tight so that you can walk across the line, right? You probably have seen that on YouTube videos. You should do that. That's a good skill to learn how to do. You can do it just a foot off the ground so that if you fall, you're not gonna get hurt. Um, but it's just a great balancing skill, which is so good for your head. Anyway, when you first start doing it, you might decide to carry some things in your hands. Maybe you could use like that last picture I just showed you, you could put some weights in your hands. Maybe you could be like a tightrope walker and you could actually have a, that big huge uh, stick that they hold in their hands. I don't know if you guys know this about the tightrope walker stick. It's super, super heavy on its ends. It's probably made of lead out here on the ends and then something lighter weight in the middle. Why is that? because with the weight distributed so far away from the center, it's really difficult to get it to move. It's got a lot of rotational inertia, okay? So if you wanna do a little trick at home, go take a hammer and put the hammer handle in your hand and stand the hammer up so it's like this, right? So it's, you know what I'm talking about, like you're taking it and balancing it like so, right? Take the hammer and balance it, and you can hold it up in your hand for a long period of time. Now, turn it over. Well, a hammer might not be the best example because the head is so heavy. But if you turn it over, you're gonna, just like with this pen, you can see it's difficult for me to keep it balanced because it doesn't have much weight. And so there's not much rotational inertia, not like a hammer has. All right. So anyway, that's number 24. Number 25, compare the effects of a force exerted on an object with a torque. A force causes a mass to accelerate, a torque causes a mass to rotate, to angularly accelerate. Question number 26, how do clockwise and counterclockwise torques compare when a system is balanced? They cancel each other out so that the net torque is zero. Question number 27, looks just like the lab that you guys just did. Uh, back when I was at Serrano and we had limited supplies, this is how we conducted this lab. Now, remember, it was a lower level physics class than what you guys have. Um, but uh, basically, we did it real simple with uh, taking a mass. Uh, you know what? I take that back. We still do something similar to this as a lab quiz. So, you know, you did it on your own at home uh, using at home uh, supplies. If you have a mass here that is one kilogram, then we can say that that mass is equal to 10 newtons and it's balanced at the one quarter mark right there. 
and we want to know this meter stick or measuring stick what its uh, weight is. So we'll call it FGMS question mark. All right. Now, uh, I don't think I lined up my. No, I did. Everything's good here. Never mind. This is good. Originally, when I've done this problem, I have the mass all the way out at the end. And because of that, the weight of the stick is the weight of the weight. But for this one here, based on where it's balanced, I hope I have the answer correct on the next slide. If not, we'll just go with my answer that I get right now. So the torque caused by the mass minus the torque caused by the meter stick. Zero equals F times R minus F times R. So if indeed I meant to do what I have in the picture here, what I'm going to use for my R, sorry, I'm trying to get the, the it won't let me get the eraser. There it is. There's my eraser. Get that off of there. Okay, so now it won't let me get the pen. There it is. 10 newtons times the distance away. I see that as 15 centimeters minus FG for the meter stick times its distance away, which is 25 centimeters. So I'm going to hope that that's what I did on the next slide. I did. Good. Pretty easy question, right? Can I give you one of those on your test just for like a lobbing a softball at you so everybody can get full credit? The main thing that I'll be looking for, I didn't really do that great a job of this when I was grading your labs. I always have better intentions when I grade labs than I actually do once I, once I get there. And the reason for this is because people like Jonathan turn his lab in, like I assign the lab and he turns the lab into me like the same day. Right. So then I want to grade his because that's only right that if you're going to give me your lab so quickly, I should give you your feedback so quickly. So I grade his lab and I grade some of the rest of your labs that I get right away. And then all of a sudden I go, oh, crap, I was supposed to look for such and such. Right. In other words, I forgot to check for the one thing that I really grade harshly on your test. And that is this number right here. Now, why is that number so important? Because what happens, especially when you do this as a actual physical lab, is people think that what they have to do for their, for their distance R is they want to go out to where the center of the rest of this stick is. So they want to go out to somewhere in this ballpark as what they put as their distance. This is really easy to grade on a test because I know where I put the fulcrum, so I know what the answer is going to be for R. Whereas at home labs, it's hard for me to tell because not all of you made a mark on your rod. So therefore, I can't for sure say whether or not you did it right or not. But the first couple labs that got turned in, I forgot to look for that anyway. So I'm like, well, then I can't do it to everybody else because that wouldn't be fair. So anyway, that's the big one is uh, making sure that your distance to your center of mass is what you use for the torque of the uh, uniform meter stick or rod or whatever you want to call it. Question numbers 28 and 29 are just simply trying to practice using the rotational inertia uh, equation. So depending on what it is, if you have a solid cylinder, okay, so here's a solid cylinder. If you want to make this solid cylinder spin, then you're going to need to know what its distribution of mass is, or more commonly what we call the moment of inertia. All right. So the moment of inertia just says take one half times the mass of the object times the radius, 0.25 meters, and you're squaring the radius. When you plug all this into your calculator, a quarter times a quarter is an eighth, times a two is a sixteenth. Ugh, you get five over 16, whatever that is as a decimal. The only reason I'm doing this out for you is because I wanted to show you that part of it. The units of moment of inertia are mass times radius squared. So you get kilograms times meters squared. Remember that you always get graded on your units on your test. So if for some reason you're solving for I, which I really doubt you're going to do on your test, you would be expected to put those units. Question number 29, same thing for a ring and a ring. Okay, so when we had a solid cylinder, because it's solid, some of its mass is distributed, you know, closer to the center. Whereas if you have a ring, then the thing about a ring is all of its mass is located. That's a horrible ring. Um, looks like an earring, maybe. 
all of its mass is distributed on the outside. So its moment of inertia formula looks a little bit different. I bet you there's people right now who are just tuning me out because they're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Well, not that you have to memorize these, but you do have to recognize that the differences between them mean that there's going to be different rolling, right? So if we have two objects here that were the exact same and you put them on an incline and you rolled the ring side by side with the solid disc, the solid disc is gonna to get to the bottom a whole lot faster than the ring is. And that's because the ring has a lot more rotational inertia, right? You can see it by the formula. So if they were the same weight and same radius, the ring gets there slower. That would make a good lab, wouldn't it? But the problem is then I'd probably have to have you guys get some woodworking tools and all that kind of stuff in order to make rings and, and discs until you could find the right size ring that rolls at exactly the same rate as a solid disc. Huh, that'd be fun. Remember, anything like that we come up with as ideas or you come up with as ideas, I'll give you extra credit if you make a lab uh, uh, based on that. I know you don't have exactly that kind of time, but I would do it. Question numbers 30 and 31. <laughs> Excuse me. Determine the angular acceleration. Oh, there's going to be another one. <laughs> angular acceleration of the wheel. So uh, somebody, thank you. Bless you. I appreciate that. That's very nice of all of you. Somebody applies a torque to this by putting a force at, a, at the outside edge of the wheel, causing the wheel to spin. Um, so we would say that the net torque is caused by the torque caused by whoever is spinning the wheel. And then the net torque equation says I times alpha instead of M times A. Isn't that nice that everything fits so, so similarly? And then out here, we're gonna say that the torque, normally we'd put F times R, but they already told us what the torque is, that it's 68 Newtons times meters. Then for I, because it's a uh, disc, we would use MR squared, and we're just trying to solve for what the alpha is. Okay, so um, are we okay with just leaving the units out at this point? You're gonna put in 1.46 kilograms times the radius 0.33 squared times alpha equals 68. And when you get your answer for alpha, even though you didn't care about the units as you went along, you better care about the units in your answer. That part has to be there. And I got 423. I don't know if I'm allergic to the rain or the air conditioner kicked on. That's what it is. It blew a bunch of dust on me. Question number 31, determine the angular acceleration that would result when a torque of 0.6 is applied to the central spin axis. So what they mean by this one is, uh, what is the video game like Mario Brothers or whatever, where you hit the coins and the coins spin sideways, you know, they spin on their, on this axis. So you're picturing this spinning this way, right? So there's just a different moment of inertia for that. So it's not the same moment of inertia for these two questions here because of the different spin axis. Um, I've never seen an AP test question that did this one, because I think it'd be confusing. It's easier just to talk about wheels, right? Everybody knows what a wheel is. Everybody knows how a wheel rolls. So therefore, uh, we wouldn't see this one, but it still works the same way. If you decide to flick a coin, of course, this isn't a coin, it's more like a ring. If you flick a ring and it spins around on a table, you just gave it angular acceleration. So we'll do exactly the same thing. Net torque equals the torque caused by somebody flicking it, and then I times alpha, and then plug in and solve for the alpha. Any questions on these before we get to the all important thread the monkey question? All right, here comes Fred the monkey. I will admit that when I was a brand new AP physics teacher, I don't remember ever doing a question like this in college. I'm sure we did, 
but you think that I'm going to remember how to do it? Of course not. So when I get this question for the first time, um, I could not figure out what I was doing wrong with this problem here because what I kept doing to this problem, and gosh, it's such, it's such classical physics to this problem. What I kept doing to this problem is I kept applying Fred's weight to the spinning of the cylinder. Fred is not what spins the cylinder. The reason why we know that Fred doesn't spin the cylinder is because Fred is accelerating downward. And the only way that Fred can accelerate downward is if we make an FG for Fred and we make an FT for the rope right here. And those two things cannot be equal and opposite to each other or else Fred would not be accelerating. Classic physics right there. Don't forget. And if you have something that is accelerating, there has to be a net force acting on it. So what I know about Fred, when I only look at the free body diagram of Fred right here, what I know about Fred is that F net equals FG for Fred minus FT. Mass times acceleration equals, I could probably put in Fred's weight right now, 10 Newtons minus FT. In fact, I could even go so far as to say one kilogram times A equals 10, uh, 10 minus F sub T. And what I've done is I've done a great job on classical physics, but I can't solve it because it has two unknowns. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have a solid cylinder and this solid cylinder is going to get angularly accelerated. The reason why it gets angularly accelerated is because the same tension force that is trying to prevent Fred from free falling is the same tension force that spins this roll here. Wouldn't this make a great lab? You're right, so I wrote one. So at home, you're gonna do this lab. You like to see it. I know you guys wanna see it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, no, no, let's do it now because if I, uh, wait till the end. People already have tuned me out. So let's see here. AP Physics, Distance Learning, Chapter 6 through 10. Come on. Uh, torque and Angular Acceleration. There it is. Look at that. There's Riley's bike. Well, hey, Riley, while it's upside down and you're changing the, the uh, tube anyway, why don't you just take care of Lab 10? I put it 10.3. Really, this should just be 10.2 because we don't we didn't have as many labs as we would in class. Okay, they're all fixed. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to take something that has a wheel, and what I'm showing you in this picture is I've put my bicycle up onto the garage bench so that the wheel is about head high up in the air. And then what you're going to do is you're going to wrap a string around it. You don't even need to attach the string because the the rubber of the tire will give enough friction to the string. And then you're going to attach some kind of mass. I don't know, like a crystal geyser water bottle, 16 ounces that you could look up online to see what it weighs. Um, the latest thing that came from Amazon, because you can just look up online, it will tell you how much the package weighs, right? Um, I don't know, a bag of coins, okay? Hey, I've got an idea for about, I don't know, five of you out there. How about when you do this lab, if you decide to do it together, do it twice. Do it once with one mass and do it a second time with another mass so that everybody has their own data. I don't mind that you do it together. I just don't want you just to do one experiment. That's not fair to the people who are all by themselves and, and have to do the lab all by themselves. When you do this, try to pick a wheel that doesn't have a lot of friction. If you're going to use a bicycle wheel, I would suggest a heavier weight. Use something like the water bottle. If you're going to use like the lawnmower wheel, then maybe you want to use something lighter, like just a handful of quarters. Um, but anyway, notice what you're doing here. I can't write on this, so I can just point with the, with the uh, mouse. Um, look at that formula right there. You're going to time the descent of the mass. Once you get that descent, you can then take that information to solve for what the acceleration is. Once you know what the acceleration is, you can take the fact that there was a tension force pulling down on the uh, wheel and that tension force created a torque. 
And from that, we can figure out the angular acceleration, right? And all of this good stuff. Now, when you guys get this lab, I just want to make sure that you understand at the very bottom of this lab is a conclusion question here that is like worth your weight in gold. You make sure you look this over closely and think about how to answer this one and you give me a good explanation for why you pick what you pick. And I don't want to read 20 answers that all look the same. So if you don't understand how to answer it, ask me. If I'm going to read 20 answers that are all the same, I want to hear my answer. Right. So make sure you do that conclusion question. Don't think just because you finished one through seven that conclusion question number one is just worth equal points and you're willing to take an eight out of 10. This lab is probably going to be worth more like 15 and conclusion question number one will probably be worth like four points. So uh, take your time with it. And the reason why I say that I took this straight off an AP test. This question right here is straight off of a multiple choice question on an AP test. The difference is you wouldn't justify your response on a multiple choice. Good times. You guys are having a lot of fun, aren't you? Any time with me is a good time, isn't it? Thanks. So now we need to deal with the solid cylinder. Um, while we're in the middle of all, no, let's talk about school after I stop the record because I don't want anything, you know, permanently recorded. If you want to record me, that's fine. I don't care. But on my own recordings that are going to be saved for future classes to use these to study, they don't need to hear about us talking about COVID. So I'm just going to keep going. All right. So now in order to spin this, um, this cylinder, we're going to do the same thing we did in questions 30 and 31. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that the net torque Sorry, I was going to do that in green. The net torque is caused by the tension. Not caused by Fred. That's a mistake that I made when I was a brand new teacher is I put Fred in here and I had an answer. I don't remember exactly how it all fit together, but somehow I knew that I had the answer and that what I was getting was wrong and I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. Well, the answer was staring me right in the face. I was not taking into account the fact that Fred has to accelerate. Fred's weight is not what pulls down on the cylinder. It's the rope that pulls down on the cylinder and the tension in the rope does not equal Fred's weight or else there wouldn't have been acceleration for Fred. All right, so FT times R equals I times alpha. For a solid cylinder, we already saw this earlier, is equal to one half MR squared. And then for alpha, I'm going to do a substitution there as well. Now let's use red for this is the fact that we know that a equals R times alpha, which means that alpha equals a divided by R. So I can do a substitution here that says a divided by R and then equals FT times R. Okay. Now let's start doing some massive uh, canceling out the R is the same all the way through. Whether I write it as a capital R or a lowercase r, the r is just this radius of the solid cylinder. So therefore I can cancel out one of these r's with this r. Now, the other r is a numerator and this r on the other side of the equal sign is also a numerator. So I can cancel out this r with the other r. So now what I have here is one half M times A equals FT. Or in other words, what do I want to say in other words? I don't know what I want to say here. Let's get this out of the way. I'm going to go back up to this problem right here and say that, don't copy this down. I'm going to put this in red on the side. No, that's not red. I'm just trying to help develop concepts because you guys already have heard me say this a number of times. The AP test could care less about math. The AP test cares about concepts. So I don't know if there's something that I wanna say conceptually here other than to say that if I would have taken this second line right here and solve for FT, it would say FT equals 10, 
minus, oh, not times, 10 minus m times a. And down here, this equation says that ft equals one half ma, right? So really in the end, we can see that we now have two equations with two unknowns, but please make sure you recognize that the M in each one of these equations is not, yes, it should be similar to an example. There should be an example that was just like this. These two M's are not the same M. One is Fred and the other is the cylinder. So then the bottom equation becomes FT equals one half of 10 times a, and this equation up here becomes ft equals 10 minus one times a. The reason why I'm saying this to you is because I know what those jerks at the AP are gonna do to us on a test. They're not gonna tell us the mass of the cylinder or the mass of Fred. And instead they're gonna say, write an expression in terms of the mass of the cylinder and the mass of, of the object suspended, uh, write an expression for ft. And then you have to make all of the connections with that and not make these two M's the same. One of them is a capital M that stands for this mass. And the other one is a lowercase M that stands for that mass. Okay, just be, you know, just to be thinking about that stuff. Your chapter test won't do that. Your chapter test, I'm gonna give you one of these. It's nice and straightforward. Form A, Fred has a mass of 0.5 kilograms. Form B, Fred has a mass of, of 1.5 kilograms. Form C, Fred is attached to a bicycle wheel instead of a solid cylinder. Form D, Fred is attached to a, uh, to a spear instead of one of those things, right? Um, what if we made it, what if we made a, uh, an, here's a good one. This will, be, this will be the makeup test. An ant is attached to a string of lint that is stuck to the ball of a roll-on deodorant stick. What's the angular acceleration of the roll-on deodorant stick ball? Wouldn't that be a fun, fun one? I mean, seriously, what's, I just made that up right now. I'm pretty impressed with myself. But you guys don't look very impressed. I get a half a smile from Karina, that's about it. Kumar, I know it's just too early in the morning for Kumar, so that's very good. So that's all right. All right, anyway, answer for question number 32 came out to be 0.9 meters per second squared. Also, all joking aside, be prepared that some form of the test might actually tell you, hey, why don't I do it like the lab? I like to make the questions like the labs. What if I tell you a distance in time and you have to use motion equations? This will be for Kyler because Kyler told me she loves the motion equations. Distance in time and you solve for the acceleration and then we work this problem backward to find out what's the mass of the cylinder or what's the mass of Fred. So be ready, any one of the things that you see here, let me start underlining or circling. This could be your unknown, 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 and distance and time could be your givens. I like that idea for a test question better because that shows me how intelligent you guys are, which is very intelligent. So then we can, um, uh, yes, if, you, if you're given any different shape, the formula for the moment of inertia will be included in that question. Nobody memorizes these formulas. But let's say that I forgot. Let's say that I give you this problem and I forgot to put the I. Look it up, right? Just go online and look it up. But I don't want to do that. I want to make sure it makes it on the test. That's why I take the test beforehand just to try to catch all the mistakes. But we know that doesn't still always work. All right, I think that's it for me. You're now looking at rotational motion, um, or well, you've been looking at that the whole time, but also looking at rotational energy. Look at that, a new kinetic energy formula. Did you know that if you took a smooth frictionless surface and took a uh, block and let it slide down the surface, the block will get to the bottom before a ball can roll to the bottom? Why is that? because some of the potential energy gets, converted, in, gets converted into this rather than into this. So you lose some of your movement energy as rolling energy. That's what this uh, section is about and it's a quick one. All right, stop share, stop record.